Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Andre Perry. I'm a fellow at the Brookings Institution, and I'm going to welcome you to this latest addition to our valuing um, Black assets in, in, in neighborhoods and um, to um, share what a little bit about what we're doing to find solutions to the problem of devaluation. I have to apologize because you are experiencing my 50th birthday celebration. My wife pulled me um, to an undisclosed lo location. Um, and, and for the sake of um, embarrassing myself, I won't share with you the details of where I am, but I'm having a good time. But unfortunately, I, I'm, the, the internet is unstable, so I'm going to have to explain why we're here and what this is about and also um, tee it up for my colleague Stuart Yasger uh, to take over from here. But as I as we started, it, the, the series started with um, a overview of my research on housing devaluation. And we looked at house housing prices in, in neighborhoods across the the United States. And um, we, of course, took an average of their prices and we learned what is not surprising that home prices in black majority neighborhoods with a share of the black population of 50% or higher is price, um, their price about half as much in areas where the population or the share of the black population is less than a percent. Now, a lot of people will say that's because of education and crime and other things, but those are things you can control for in a study. So that's what we did. We controlled for education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics so that we could get an apples to apples comparison. And we found that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by a billion, billions of dollars, about 48,000 per home, collectively about 156 billion in lost equity. Now, we know that that's the money communities use to uh, fund education, to fund infrastructure projects, um, to um, fund other services like policing. But it's also the money that people, individuals use to lift themselves up by the bootstrap. So that's the money that, that money, 156 billion, would have financed more than 4 million businesses based on the average amount blacks used to start up their firm it would have funded more than eight million degrees four-year degrees based on the average amount of a public four-year education it's a big amount so this is the money that's being extracted by racism every single day in our country that that 156 billion is only from 2017 data um, can you imagine the compounding effects of that, that those those losses in revenue, but what why we're here is we're trying to find solutions to this problem. We created the problem by through policies like redlining and other issues, but we can reverse many of these issues by exacting policy that adds wealth and and prosperity and inclusion in, in communities, and particular deal with this issue of. Um, housing devaluation. So I'm joined with my colleague from the Ashoka organization, Stuart Yasger, who will um, talk with a, um, a few panelists who have been in the business of finding solutions. Um, today we're going to talk with Arthur Thomas, Director of Entrepreneurial I Initiatives and Inclusion, Economic Opportunity for the Community Foundation of Greater New Haven, Anika Singh Lamar, Clinical Associate professor of law um, and YLS Community and Economic Development Cl Clinic, and Billy Wang, founder at Source Development Hub. Um, and so um, I'm going to uh, kick it off to Stuart, who's going to start the activities. And I'm going to sit back and just view from my perch of 50 years old. So enjoy. Hey, thank you, Andre, and happy birthday. Um, uh, you know, I, 
I think it's a good goal to sit back. I don't know if we're going to totally let you sit back. We, we want some of that 50 years of wisdom participating in this conversation. So we'll, we'll see if we can pull you back in. Uh, but thank you for kind of framing things. I, I do want to just uh, welcome everybody um, here also to the Economic Architecture Intensive on redesigning our markets to value assets in black neighborhoods. Uh, this is, as Andre mentioned, this is the third of three sessions moving from real look at the problem and increasingly towards solutions. Uh, I, I want to mention right from the outset that the intensive, this intensive is an offering uh, of the incredible Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale University, um, Sci City for short, uh, whose mission it is to inspire students from diverse backgrounds and disciplines to seek innovative ways to solve real world problems. Uh, so I want to thank Sci City for, for all the work you've done to, to host these conversations. Um, before we get into things, just so everybody has kind of a sense of, of what we hope to do together today. Um, I'll make just a few comments for, at the outset, um, and then uh, we'll turn quickly to uh, getting to, to listen to and learn from our, our three panelists for today's conversation. Uh, and then uh, towards the latter part of the, the session today, we're gonna try and do two design sessions, two 10 minute interactive breakouts with a discussion in between. Um, uh, so we're really looking forward to active participation and ideas from everybody who's joined us today. Uh, I wanna, I'll name the five different breakout sessions that we have listed for today and then and then we'll uh, you'll have a chance to opt in to which whichever breakout session uh, kind of you're most interested in as we get to get there in the program so the the five different sessions are uh, first the importance of local and state policy in access to opportunity second reimagining assets in black and brown communities third the importance of investing in people in place uh, fourth democratizing data and resources through tech innovation and Finally, fifth, uh, the, the role of innovations in finance in addressing devaluation. Uh, so that's, that will, you'll have an opportunity to choose which of those sessions you're involved, interested in participating in as we go. Um, you know, I think Andres, uh, you know, did a really elegant job of kind of explaining his work and the importance of it. Um, as someone who's uh, kind of learned from him, I thought maybe I could just share three ways that I, you know, three of the points that I think are really important in, in how he's reframing the conversation. Uh, first of all, he's focusing our attention on assets, assets in, in black majority neighborhoods, over $600 billion worth of assets in, in those neighborhoods alone. Uh, second, he's shown us um, that obviously there's a price difference and that the reason for the price difference is not what many people might think it is. Uh, the reason that the home prices are lower in black majority neighborhoods is because markets are devaluing assets of black majority neighborhoods. Uh, specifically, you know, by in, in the work that they did, they found that homes uh, in black majority neighborhoods were devalued by over $156 billion. It's an enormous amount of wealth. Uh, and then uh, finally, the third point is he draws a really straight line connection between the impact of taking away $156 billion of wealth um, from a community and the impact it has on people's lives. Um, so, you know, I think when, when I learned about Andre's work, um, uh, I think it, it raised a really important question for us. You know, when, when you see the problem, you're asked what you're gonna do about it. Um, and I don't think it's an easy question to answer, not just because uh, housing is complicated, but also because the, of the magnitude of the problem, right? Um, to address devaluation, uh, we need to come to terms with the fact that uh, devaluation isn't an exception to the rule. Devaluation is a result of the rules. Right. And so addressing devaluation is gonna require us to change some of those rules. Um, but when we say that, I wanna be really clear, what we mean is it's not just that we need new regulations and enforcement mechanisms. You know, I think we know that we can't just legislate our way, uh, legislate markets um, to, to stop devaluation. But what we can do is start to design or, or redesign our markets to make it far more likely that they'll effectively value assets in black majority neighborhoods. Um, and so that's really the, the question that we, that's at the heart of this intensive. How do we design our markets to value assets in black majority neighborhoods? Um, as Andre mentioned, we've been working on this for some time. Uh, I think we're, we're aware of the fact that it's unlikely that there's gonna be any single silver bullet solution to this. Um, and we're also aware of the fact that, that we're probably not best positioned to offer answers to the question. Uh, you know, addressing devaluation really requires a broad range of structural innovations and those innovations should be informed by the insights and the ideas of people who are proximate to the problem. 
so our approach, instead of trying to offer a solution, Andre and I have been working hard to, we're building a partnership between Ashoka and the Brookings Institution um, with one goal. Our goal is to foster a new generation of those innovations that address um, devaluation of black majority neighborhoods. Um, at the heart of that, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, but at the heart of it, there is a collaborative challenge uh, that we're developing. The challenge will be open to everyone. So please, if you are the right, if you have interest in participating, please um, do. Uh, the challenge will have $1 million in prize funds. Um, $1 million is certainly, it's, it's a lot of money. Uh, it's a lot of money to raise, as, as Andre and I know really well. Uh, but we're also really aware that $1 million is just a start. It, it's just a step in the direction. Um, so we're also working very hard to bring together a variety of different resources that are gonna be needed to succeed. Um, certainly more money, but also uh, we're gonna need banks to play a role. We need financial institutions, we need philanthropic funders, we need social investors, we need policymakers, community members. We need a variety of different partners to come to the table to really make it successful. Uh, so we're working hard to do that. And increasingly um, uh, people are, are coming to the table in that way. Uh, and and you know, it's one of the reasons why we're here today because uh, uh, we would love you members of uh, the broader community, members of the Yale community, members of the New Haven community, to participate, to play a role, to help uh, move this forward. Um, before going on, I do also, we also need to kind of note that while we're optimistic about the prospect of addressing devaluation, we're also very uh, aware of the need uh, to be cautious. Uh, um, in particular, you know, as we're talking about major structural changes in markets and design, redesigning markets, that can have a beneficial effect, but it can also have uh, there can also be negative consequences uh, that we need to be aware of, right? Uh, um, re just increasing home prices in black majority neighborhoods could price people out of the market. It could make homes that uh, are currently affordable less so. Uh, it could also expose those neighborhoods to speculation and gentrification um, as others come in to kind of benefit from price appreciation. So, so we're very clear about the need to be cautious. Um, it's also one of the reasons why the structural innovations uh, that we're looking for really need to be grounded in an understanding of the communities that are impacted by devaluation. Um, you know, so as we're working on this, we're really, we're understanding that, you know, devaluation is a nationwide phenomenon. It can't just be addressed at the local level, but it also needs to be addressed at the local level. And so we try to incorporate this kind of national, uh, local character into our work by, by kind of having a national challenge with a focus in strategic cities across the country. Um, I, I should say that we, it's not currently, but we do hope that New Haven will eventually be uh, uh, one of those strategic cities that we focus on, in part because of the unique situation in New Haven and the, and the incredible work that's being done there. Um, and, you know, and it's also one of the reasons for us uh, why we think it's so important to you know, focus on, listen to, and learn from people who are at, at the edge of um, addressing these problems today in, in these places. Um, and so that's one of the many reasons why we're um, kind of excited by the prospect of, of listening to and learning from uh, our panelists today, uh, Anika Singh Lamar, uh, Billy Wong, uh, um, and Arthur Thomas. Um, and maybe if we can go, uh, who will have a chance to share with us, uh, possibly in that order, a little bit about the work that they're doing. Um, and so with that, Anika, I turn it over to you. Thank you. It's a real um, pleasure to be here. I've been inspired by, um, by Andre's work, by Ashoka's work for a long time, and um, feel like it's a real privilege to be here speaking with you all. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I do in the, um, and that my clients do, um, uh, in, that is related here. Um, um, I'll start off by just saying I, I represent, um, the clinic that I teach represents a number of um, affordable housing developers and also fair housing advocates. I consider myself um, what uh, lawyers call a dirt lawyer, um, which is to say somebody who just makes transactions happen and hopefully makes, you know, housing and other um, real property happen. Um, and I like the term economic architecture quite a lot, um, partly because it's a good reminder that our current economy itself is designed. Um, and I think Stuart and Andre almost probably not characteristically, but we're almost too nice to, to the current situation to say that the market undervalues black owned assets and assets in black neighborhoods. It's not the market, I mean, it's market participants, which is to say people. We all collectively as a society, as members of a society, undervalue black owned assets and black neighborhoods. Um, and that is uh, pretty depressing, but it, I also think it poses some opportunities. So 
um, before I kind of wrap up and turn it over to, to Billy in a few minutes, I'm going to come back to where I think that the very sort of pessimistic version of this also gives us, should give us some optimism. So, um, you know, part of the reason for the undervaluation of, um, of Black-owned assets and Black neighborhoods is because those neighborhoods are historically under-resourced. And that's entirely by design. The <clears throat> policies that we all are kind of vaguely aware of, some of us more intimately aware of than others, that gave rise to segregated neighborhoods, restrictive covenants and redlining, and today exclusionary zoning, um, don't exist just because white people wanted to separate themselves from black people, although that's certainly a piece of it and continues to be a piece of it today. They also exist because white people wanted to have nice things that they didn't want to share with black people. Um, so this is the sort of resource, the resources that come with location. We all kind of know this. Realtors talk about location, location, location. You can buy a crummy house in a neighborhood with nice parks and nice schools and the like and make it a nicer house. Um, but if you buy a house in a neighborhood that has not so good parks and not so good schools, um, then that's a tougher thing to create. That's a tougher place to create value. Um, and it's that um, linkage between housing and these other resources that creates such a big part of the puzzle here, but also which is the thing about our current economy that is designed. So you can imagine an economy where school districts and housing were not linked for example, or you could imagine an economy where um, here in Connecticut, we have 169 towns. They all have their own local government. They all have their own local school district for the most part. Um, and the ability of white families to easily flee urban centers, to be in the same job market place, but cross town lines into a different school district, um, a different tax rate, et cetera, um, actually creates quite a lot of um, uh, more segregation than you would have in a world where we didn't have tiny, tiny towns in larger um, job markets. Um, the uh, phenomenon is not just limited to uh, sort of our cities versus our suburbs. Um, what we've seen in Connecticut uh, echoes of a phenomenon that also takes place nationally, which is um, where inner ring suburbs, where African American families and Latinx families may make a foothold. Um, once they become uh, diverse to a certain degree, they tend to quote unquote flip because there's um, a limit to how much diversity white families are willing to take before they'll flee to the next suburb over. Um, so we see that fun for that phenomenon as well. And then you'll see suburbs like, you know, the Connecticut examples would be like West Haven, Hamden in the Hartford area, East Hartford, et cetera, where you start to see the same rising tax rates, the same devalued housing. Um, almost more tragically than it was in the city because those are places where in theory um, black families had found a foothold into household wealth and then they lose it because of the resegregation phenomenon. Um, so these are obviously big problems. Um, in terms of my day-to-day -day work, the things that we work on, one of the things we work on in an effort to address this is to think about the policy mechanisms that are used today to perpetuate this cycle. Um, and the, one of the big ones in Connecticut today is land use and zoning policy that in these, um, in the whitest of neighborhoods, you have the strictest of zoning, um, which makes it very hard for um, families with less wealth to acquire housing. And we know that there's a massive racial wealth gap um, uh, um, that makes it very hard uh, disproportionately for families of color to to, to get into those neighborhoods that have the lower tax rates and have the schools with higher test scores. Um, uh, there's a, you know, Brookings study from Jonathan Rothwell from, I don't know, it's a little old at this point, eight or maybe eight or nine years ago that in New Haven County puts that, um, the annual housing cost imposed on a family that would like to live in a district where the schools are in the top 20% of test scores is $13,000 a year. So obviously that's a, lot of, that's a lot of money that's basically private school tuition. Um, uh, so the kinds of solutions we focus on are um, busting up the land use and zoning um, <laughs> connection, decrease, making it easier to build housing, both uh, subsidized affordable housing and what we call naturally occurring affordable housing in the suburbs. Um, a client of ours filed an application with our assistance two weeks ago to eliminate single family only zoning in the very white town of Woodbridge, which is immediately adjacent to New Haven. but uh, despite the fact that it is immediately adjacent to New Haven, 
is um, uh, I, I, is ninety five percent white and Asian. Um, there are other towns in Connecticut that have pretty similar demographics and exactly the same land use and zoning policies. Um, we try to de-link the requirement that people are wealthy in order to um, to acquire assets. So uh, we work with small businesses and the groups that work that also work with small businesses to try to decrease barriers to entry. So in a world where there's a massive wealth gap, anything that requires wealth in order to enter into a um, a livelihood, a business, a housing market is going to have a disproportionate impact based on race. So we work on decreasing barriers to entry for different kinds of um, small businesses. Um, and then the final thing I'll say, and this is where I think the, um, uh, with, well, I'll say two final things. One, I'll just point out that the policy measures that I've just described are all race neutral on their face and they're probably not going to get us there so um we also we don't have a client specifically working on reparations but we think that that's probably fundamental to the solution we have problems that were created in a non-race neutral way the idea that we're going to fix them in a race neutral way is you know probably a little pie in the sky the second thing i'd say is again like we are all the participants in this marketplace right so to the extent that we as participants in this marketplace are also choosing to value white neighborhoods and white schools um, more than we value black neighborhoods and black schools, we are complicit um, in this thing. So um, it is, I think there's um, more and more of a recognition of that complicity and what individual people can do. So I cannot today solve this problem nationally but I can today say that, yeah, my kids, kids are not gonna go to a 95% white school, even though that's the thing that's historically valued because I don't value that. And um, to the small degree that I play a role in this marketplace as an individual human being, um, let me not ascribe value to that thing. Um, and I think there's more and more opportunities for, for people who have power, powerful roles in a marketplace to, to play that role. Um, and I think Billy was next. Do you want me to popcorn it over, Stuart? Let's go for it. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, Anika, you brought some really crucial points that I'll tr try to touch on as well. Um, first off, um, I'm really glad to be here, very privileged to be here, uh, to be able to talk about some of the projects that we're currently working on and how they can further drive ideation in this space. Uh, so I'm a social entrepreneur and a second year MBA student at SLM. I'm most interested in the ways in which we can leverage technology to break some of these vicious cycles in, of inequity that have been touched upon. So I work in housing specifically at the intersection of trying to understand barriers to housing access at both an individual and community level, and then being able to visualize these barriers and to design solutions such as software apps that might be able to tackle some of these access issues. Uh, what this really means is that I try to map where housing is affordable and then be able to connect folks who need affordable housing to those resources. Uh, so it's just housing, right? Um, not exactly. Housing is a really core element of what makes us thrive. And without it, it becomes really difficult to access other kinds of resources. It's quite difficult, for example, to even open a bank account if you're homeless. And there's a lot of other consequences, such as worse uh, health outcomes. Now, these issues of housing instability disproportionately affect communities of color. For instance, if you were to look at a heat map of black and brown neighborhoods in New Haven, you'll see a clear overlap with areas that are one, experiencing the highest eviction rates, two, the lowest home ownership rates, and three, recently, they're the most impacted by COVID-19. So you cannot talk about housing without talking about race. Um, a little background, I started delving into the space about four years ago now, scraping aggregated eviction records throughout uh, Connecticut. Matt Desmond, who runs the eviction lab at Princeton, does this at a national level. And at that time, I was volunteering at New Haven Legal, which has been at the forefront of a lot of these issues of uh, racial equity. Uh, many of you may have heard from Alexa Smith, who is their executive director during the last session here. Um, so I had the idea to check some eviction hotspots in New Haven. And unsurprisingly, many were in communities of color. 
So I collaborated with a faculty member in the School of Medicine to organize a student project uh, from YSPH to take a deeper dive into qualitatively accessing uh, some of these uh, issues. Um, and one thing led to another, um, and soon looking into evictions and homelessness became a full-time job for me. Um, I started ideating, networking with many local nonprofits, eventually beginning to work on understanding the larger issue of affordable housing. So one of the groups that I started working with, the Fairview County Center for Housing Opportunity, is a really cool initiative um, with several area organizations that are looking into some of these issues. The problem with Connecticut, as um, Anika mentioned, is that uh, we have an incredibly segregated state and no county level initiatives. There's 169 towns and there's 169 ways of doing things. And there's no centralized data platform. Uh, New York, for, for instance, has this wonderful open data platform that allows researchers and advocates to have a wealth of information. And while use Furman Center, uh, which is a joint uh, collaboration between their law school and school of uh, social work, has done an extremely granular project that has mapped subsidized housing for the entire city of New York. This level of sophistication does not exist here in Connecticut. So earlier this year, my group and I have been working with our partners in Fairfield County, as well as several national organizations to be able to map this affordable housing uh, for the state of Connecticut's Department of Housing. Uh, and we aim to use this mapping project as a springboard for an integrated affordable housing marketplace. So think Zillow, except what you're really trying to maximize is opportunity in the, in the housing search. And that includes access to education, transportation, healthcare, and probably most importantly, jobs. So this really goes back to Anika's points about the importance of location in access to opportunity. Um, and so that, that's where we are. I would just like to conclude by saying that's very important that this type of data becomes free and open to the public. When folks in economic development, for instance, push back against racial equity initiatives, they often do so because advocates don't have enough information. Development folks, especially housing developers, for example, really only care about the numbers uh, rather than stories. They care about funding, they care about making affordable housing projects sustainable. So being able to explain the need for additional affordable housing capital stacks to policymakers is really important and only possible if we have a strong understanding of the data. So being able to quantitatively aggregate housing information and disparities, ensuring that policymakers, advocates, and the public begins to allow us to begin to, you know, attack these racial inequities from multiple fronts. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to author. Thanks, Billy. Thank you, Anika. Um, it's a good morning, afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure being here. Um, I'm at the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, and we pretty much are the largest philanthropic organization in the region, um, providing a, a myriad of services and capital to local nonprofits and some for-profits across the different communities and cities that we serve. Um, I will say that I am also a fan of Ashoka's economic architecture um, scholarship and research. I really like the terminology and the direction that's going, and as well as Dr. Perry's book, Know Your Price, and just this notion of value in Black assets. I love the personal touch to your story, Andrea, and talking about your personal story coming from Wilkinsburg, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, which reminded me so much of Newark, New Jersey, where I'm from. And, you know, this notion that I think one part of the book you said, you know, my lived experience has value within itself, that that's an asset, right? And I, I, I'm a firm believer of that, that my lived experience is an asset. So um, anyway, so today, I, we've come from a different perspective with the work I do, um, not too much of a different perspective, but the work I do at the Community Foundation is around looking at um, equity and opportunity for some of the underconnected neighborhoods, you know, so we're looking at some of the things that you're talking about, valuing black assets, brown assets, and economic architecture from a more structural innovation side. Um, and so just to give a little bit of background for those who are not familiar with New Haven, um, New Haven is one of the four major cities here in Connecticut. Um, and in terms of demographic, New Haven residents pretty much identifies one third black, one third Latinx, one third Caucasian or white. Um, and it's unique because the state of Connecticut seems to be majority suburban and, and white state, right? Um, it's also, New Haven is also a sanctuary city that provides safe haven for uh, refugees. Um, and of course, many of the black and brown neighborhoods within these cities have experienced some of the same prevailing challenges as uh, in devaluation um, of other cities across the country. So as such for our work, we, you know, we're striving 
to respond to the disinvestment of social and community supports by forging new pathways to economic mobility. Um, we're in the process of building what's called an equitable entrepreneurial ecosystem that we're calling NHE3 for now. And the NHE3 is a project partnership between um, with, with Community Foundation, a national nonprofit called Forward Cities based out of Durham, um, the New Haven Innovation Collaborative, and a few other local community organizations that really what we're doing is what Stuart said earlier is that you have this national perspective, but we're drawing on the local expertise to come up with some of the structural solutions that are needed to really value black and brown assets. Uh, Forward Cities has a track record of building these ecosystems in nine other major cities across the country uh, who have experienced those same effects of racial and geographic devaluation. Um, and so with the NHE3, we're endeavoring to kind of close those opportunity gaps for black, brown and women entrepreneurs and residents who kind of reside at the periphery of privilege um, in some of the most underserved, under-resourced and underconnected communities here in New Haven. So we think, we believe honestly that the NHE3, as we're calling it, is a structural innovation that it tends to produce benefits for black and brown entrepreneurs, uh, appreciate black assets and combat black devaluation through entrepreneurship. Um, we're seeking to really like move to the root of the racial inequities that affect black wealth accumulation by removing some of the barriers to income and savings that contribute to financial well-being. Um, and we do this through pretty much three main components. Um, there's of course the equity component piece, which is huge, right? Um, and we're talking about advocacy and policies that support black and brown entrepreneurs and just their well-being. We're talking about really like instilling a recognition that black and brown life itself is worth something of value. And potentially, can we put a premium on that value, right? This value has been discounted for generations and centuries. How about putting a premium on that value? Um, can we create an environment that offers the actors here in this market um, an opportunity to be seen? And so and other actors besides black and brown actors will agree that this premium or this appreciation of black value um, is such that the policies and practices and investments will reflect that ideology. So that's what those things are what inform those structural innovations. And we're also just simply advocating in this equity piece for political, social, and commercial restructuring that demonstrates a recognition of that value. So that's the equity piece you know, uh, of the ecosystem building work that we're doing. The next major piece is capacitation. And that's really providing business acumen. It's providing entrepreneurial competencies, um, access to opportunities, access to capital previously barred and segregated from some, most of these residents, we all know that's a huge part of the work. And essentially like we're looking at developing black and brown human capital, you know, and potentially equipping them with the tools, you know, the resources that align with this assumed value that we believe that they, that is had. And so hopefully we can incubate and accelerate um, black potential and give them the type of resources they need to reinvest back into the communities in which they dwell. And then I think the final piece, which is a huge piece, is uh, a narrative component, right? Their narratives are the heartbeat of this story. Narratives that really affirm the very being and doing of Black persons, right? That increase the sense of belonging by addressing that root ideology of anti-Black racism that, we, you know, that people will keep skipping over, right? This anti-Black racism, these color-coded constructions of difference that attaches inferiority values to dark phenotypical behavioral traits, right? Like that's, that's what we're talking about here. And also it touches that inferiority value to the communities in which they dwell, which Anika was speaking to before, right? These communities have an inferiority value, inferior value attached to them. So for us in many ways, NHE3 is a structural innovation that penetrates through and to those root causes you know, black and brown devaluation, dislocation, dispossession, denigration, disinheritance, like the, all of that. Because at the core, we're really talking about valuing human lives, right? The life of human beings. Black people are humans, women are humans, brown people are humans first. And simply because of that, simply because of that, we're valuable. And our particularity contributes to that value, right? In colorful and nuanced ways. And so if we increase that value of black potential and put a premium on that value, hopefully, um, then we're really saying that there's a lot of opportunity for black possibility and potential. And so therefore, if we believe that, if the ideology reflects that, we should see different structural supports and practices. We should see new markets emerging that 
adhere to that ideology, we should see existing markets contribute to the appreciation of, of black and brown offerings and assets, right? We should see those things start to take shape. And so that, our hope here is that NHE 3 contributes to the economic architecture as Ashoka describes it and defines it, that harness the power of the markets to improve the character and quality of black and brown lives. And we're confident that if we can just do this correctly, if we can do what Dr. Perry suggested in his book and reimagine the value of black lived experience, black homes, black properties, black creativities, black culture, black dancing, black people, then coming off the heels of Indigenous Day, um, we, I think we're at least in the beginning of the process of simply valuing people's lives for who they are. That, that is remarkable. I, um, you know, I, I could have continued to, to listen and, and learn from each of the three of you as you're, as you're going forward. Thank you. I think that's a really powerful um, piece to, pieces to have shared. Um, we'd like to, um, we're now going to try and uh, broaden the conversation by bringing other folks into it. We're going to try and transition to, to kind of work these breakout sessions. The goal of the breakout sessions um, is to start to moving us inspired by these um, three panelists to start entertaining and exploring the possibilities of solutions to understand. Uh, in, in the first session, kind of how are each of these topics connected to the valuation that we're currently seeing? Uh, kind of where are their opportunities um, for change? And kind of what would those opportunities for change look like? We're, we're going to try and do a 10 minute uh, initial session, uh, come back, share insights from each of those sessions. Uh, we'll be each be asked uh, in those sessions to find somebody who's willing to be a scribe and then secondly to find somebody who's willing to report back. Um, I think it's a familiar format for many of you who've been living in the Zoom world. Uh, and so we'll move to that now. I think the, um, just to remind everybody of the five different sessions. The first is the importance of local and state policy and access to opportunity. Second is reimagining assets in black and brown communities. Uh, the third uh, was the importance of investing in people in place, and, and Andre was going to try and host that. Uh, we'll see how that works with this current technology setup. Uh, fourth was democratizing data and resources through technology and innovation. And the, and the fifth was uh, the role of financial innovation. Uh, so, Cassie, or do we have the ability to kind of give people the, to, the opportunity to opt into the different breakout sessions at this point? Yes, everyone should be able to see the breakout rooms and select. This is wonderful to see the faces of everybody who's participating. Um, fantastic. Oh, I'm sure you all had, uh, our session was cut short just mm -hmm. in the middle of kind of a really exciting kind of exchange. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that's kind of reflective of, of the conversations that were happening elsewhere. Uh, we want to just in, in uh, 10 minutes kind of quickly go around the virtual room and, and get some indication of, of the the questions and, and uh, some of the momentum in the conversations. Um, if, I don't know whether everybody, every room was diligent in, in picking a reporter back. Um, for those of you who are, does anybody want to raise their hand and, and take yeah, the first? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to start off. I'm going to um, model behavior. I, 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 we talked about investing in people in place, and Tiffany and Naveed was on fire with their solutions, starting um, t um, talking about down payment assistance and, um, and, and, and business and investing in commercial corridors, um, debt cancellation ideas. But the, I mean, it, it was clear that people saw the need to invest in people um, as well as place. Um, but it, you, can't, you can't sidestep the people um, in, in, in in our pursuit of improving communities. So I'll end it there. And I can jump in next. My group is talking about financing, financing solutions. Um, and when we, in terms of where to start, we talk a lot about what does it mean to think about asset framing? Um, so what assets are uh, undervalued, what assets are there, um, and what assets are abundant and not recognized? Um, this idea of kind of artificial ceiling on home pricing. Stuart talked a lot about how when you're appraising a house, oftentimes you're appraising the price based on comparative houses. And if you have generations of redlining and kind of forced devaluation, then that gets the, that's perpetuated in the future and you don't ever get to start with a clean slate. Um, also, those undervalued assets are taxed higher because the communities that they operated in 
I'm also thinking about credit rating on a personal level. What does it mean to have a credit score knowing that things like utility bills that go to credit agencies are the largest debt for low income people and that counts against your credit rating. So what does it mean to have things like character-based lending instead of credit um, rating? Uh, obviously reparations came up and also this idea about how do you develop financial instruments to invest in the quote unquote uninvestable individuals um, and provide financial vehicles that, that can help allow that. Great, um, thanks, uh, Oni. Uh, just moving past um, a little bit about, you know, um, you know, investing in people um, is really looking at the macro picture of investing in, in data, which is what we, uh, we, we talked a little bit about. Um, so Alakai, uh, Derek, and Alex um, uh, came up with some really good solutions um, or, and also um, identified key areas where, you know, we, we think data might be helpful. So part of it is, you know, first of all, you can't talk about data without, you know, being able to understand what that data is. So things like STEM education is also really important to, as a first step for, you know, communities to be able to understand, you know, what's out there. Um, so starting entrepreneurial clubs around STEM would be really important, but then digging into the data itself, um, looking at things like rental data, a lot of data isn't open out there. So Zillow is not open, Airbnb is not open. So being able to get, um, you know, a lot of these data insights or working with firms to, you know, source some of these, whether or not, you know, it's through some of their CSR initiatives or whether or not, you know, there's other ways to incentivize some of these firms to share that data is also really important. And then being able to work uh, finally to identify some opportunities upstream and then downstream, um, you know, very important, the downstream elements, you know, who this data is going to serve, um, you know, the stakeholders, um, you know, things like community foundations and whatnot. I, I guess we can go, I'll follow the, the instructions and, and we have a spoke person that will go for the group also happens to be my other boss. So I'll let Dr. Jennifer Pierre, <laughs> Tom is my wife, do the speaking. Thank you, I'm finished. So um, in our group, we discussed reimagining assets in black and brown communities. And it was not set up that I was gonna be in the same group as my husband. I just was really interested in this. Um, but I loved our group because it was it showed diversity just in the um, participants in our group and people who are really, really anxious to see um, a New Haven that uh, had more value than I think people ascribe to New Haven. Um, we all enjoy living in New Haven. And one of the biggest things that we talked about is when we're talking about assets um, and anything that, and, and Arthur kind of guided us with this, um, you know, anything that can improve the quality of life, material or non-material. So one thing that uh, came up in our conversation, um, obviously, is lived experience um, and how that can be an ass asset um, of people and culture. But we talked about the fact that while New Haven can be a little segregated, um, each neighborhood has a personality. And a few of us had Westville in common and discussed how it's an artsy community and also has a progressive energy um, and how it would be great to see more of that energy in other areas, um, you know, not only in New Haven, but, you know, in Connecticut as a state. So the fact that it is very diverse, um, which is not, you know, uh, not something that I personally have seen in a lot of areas of uh, Connecticut, but also in that diversity, there's an appreciation of the diversity as far as in food and culture and arts. And um, when we've all attended events in Westville, we've seen that. So I think just starting with having an appreciation of black and brown communities and what they bring to a community. And that's something that we, we tended to see. And um, one of our participants, uh, Shayla, who was originally from New Haven, born and raised, she talked about her experience in moving from Westville to Fairhaven and admitting that she wanted to spend more time in that community as it was foreign for her and learn more about the Latinx community that she was now being exposed to. So, you know, in that reimagining assets, there has to be an appreciation. And so we thought one good way to start is just immersing yourself in neighborhoods that are diverse and not being scared. Um, 
you know, Anika mentioned something earlier about once there's a certain amount of minorities in a community, there tends to be that white flight. So, you know, maybe making more of an effort of being in diverse neighborhoods and, and embracing that and sharing that with other people um, that you may be familiar with. So that's what we talked about. Wonderful. I think that may have been all of the rooms. Is it? We didn't. We, we got. We got one more. Oh. Um, I'll be. I'll be pretty quick through it though. Um, I was in the room with with Anika and Karima and uh, and Emma, someone who had to leave early. We ended up talking a lot about history um, as well. We talked about urban renewal in New Haven um, and and Durham um, in, in North Carolina, where where I've lived, have very similar histories, very similar profiles of uh, the way which highway construction and urban renewal was used to destroy a lot of black wealth and destroy black communities. Um, the, the sort of grounding in history, I think, brought us back to uh, a point that we shared with others, which is that reparations matter. You have to have kind of race-targeted solutions to address race-targeted problems. Um, and Inigo was raising some uh, some interesting questions about, you know, who wh whether people are are specifically targeting the question of uh, the inequities in pricing of Black-owned assets. Um, as opposed to a lot of the issues that are connected to that and, and obviously, you know, intertwined very deeply like segregation, um, like uh, inequality in schools um, and kind of asking questions about, you know, whether there are models of uh, addressing the kind of uh, the, the lack of wealth uh, and the lack of value in black communities or that valuing of black communities um, that can be addressed. Um, without leading to problems like gentrification and without leading to that wealth essentially being being taken and uh, being right sized for somebody else, somebody else who's not actually a part of that community. So no solutions really, we just named a lot of problems. <laughs> but, but really important context. I, I think, um, uh, so I have the, the, the unfortunate role of pointing out what, what I think we all recognize, which is that it's very close to the end of our session. Uh, and that uh, even though there's so much enthusiasm for the, continuing the conversation. I think we're, we uh, are in the situation where we're gonna have to pause um, and, and, and pause here. I know um, in our session, we had just, there were, you know, Stephen, for example, had kind of articulated questions that would have been really helpful to get back to. Um, uh, and so we won't, unfortunately, I wanna acknowledge that we won't be able to do all of that today, uh, but this is a conversation that's continuing. Um, we are uh, in this large effort, um, we'll be doing a lot of mapping of innovations that are out there. Um, if there are thoughts, um, suggestions that you have, we would love to know about them. Um, this uh, is a pretty major undertaking for us. Um, we also would like to, have, to come back and share what we're learning um, with this community. So keep your eyes out uh, for that probably in the spring. Um, and I just wanna uh, say thank you since this is the closing of our third of the three sessions, I do wanna also say thank you to Cassie uh, and Oni and Richard and Nancy and so many people at Yale and uh, especially Sci City for this remarkable effort to put this all together. I, I hope this is the first of a number of other sessions that we end up doing on this topic and on economic architecture more broadly. Um, so thank you all. And, and last words to you, Andre? No, well, no, I, I, I was made full by the, the recommendations, suggestions, um, with work of the panelists. And so I'm really hoping that Dr. Jennifer can continue to, to contribute in some kind of way, an author um, following proper protocol of lifting family and, and professionalism to the highest levels. But um, um, Billy and, um, um, and oh, I'm blanking on our, uh, uh, the other panelist's name, help me Stuart. Anika, thank you, Anika. Anika, yeah, oh, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. But um, we look forward to your participation in this challenge. And um, I think at, at the end of the day, we want your input, we want your inclusion, that we talk about the impacts of exclusion all day, but at the end, um, but our effort is to bring your voices into this, this challenge. So um, again, thank you for participating and I look forward to working with you in the near future. Take care. Thank and happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. happy birthday. Happy birthday, brother. That's exactly right. Let's happy get it. Happy birthday. <laughs> Hope your life is full of pleasure. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy right. birthday.